In a previous video, we discussed the history of the islands up until the 20th century. In this segment, we'll take a look at the circumstances that led to the 1982 conflict between Argentina and the United Kingdom and how the conflict eventually played out. If we fast forward to the 20th century, shifting borders, fresh alliances and post-war decolonization all created a fresh set of challenges for countries like the United Kingdom, upon whose empire the sun was by now most definitely setting. Novel sovereignty claims upon the resources of marine continental shelves and a desire to rid themselves of their colonial legacy saw many countries from Asia to Africa and Latin America assert their rights in forums such as the newly established United Nations. Argentina was no exception, and by the 1960s, the UN had called upon the two countries to come to a resolution regarding the Falkland Islands. The United Kingdom, virtually bankrupt after World War II, and now without any real need of a South Atlantic naval base, that used to service the whaling industry and Cape Horn clipper ships from a bygone era, now considered it increasingly expedient to hand over the territory to Argentina, and negotiations were entered into by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to do so, just like they'd been doing with colonies all across their former empire. But the problem was that, by now, the Falklands had been settled in significant numbers by successive generations of mostly British residents, whose population of several thousand were highly unlikely to swap the foxtrot for the tango. Maybe 30 years before, but definitely not now. You see, poor old Argentina, whose capital of Buenos Aires was once considered the Paris of the Americas, was, in the 1920s, one of the richest nations in the world, with a wealth of natural resources and an export market that made it the envy of the West. There are many complex reasons for its decline that are beyond the scope of even one of my rabbit holes. Suffice to say that the violent military coup against President Irigoyen's democratically elected government saw the installation of a repressive de facto fascist regime that was hostile to both open markets and free trade, imposing severe tariffs on imports and manipulating its exchange rate to protect local industrialists. This, along with traditionalist agricultural practices that were resistant to modernization and fluctuations in commodity prices, gave rise to an instability in the economy that, damaged further in the Great Depression, was increasingly dependent on government intervention. But perhaps most importantly, there were inadequate literacy levels and informal public institutions, considered crucial in the formation of any middle class upon whom rests the entire fabric of liberal democracy, and who typically buffer the electorate from the excessive and volatile influence of powerful political lobby groups, both left and right. Sound familiar? You bet. Anyway, the growing divide between rich and poor eventually led to widespread social unrest and a new coup d'etat in 1946 that saw the installation of Colonel Juan Perón, who, with his wife Evita, began an aggressive program of nationalisation of industry and public spending on schools, hospitals and other social welfare programs. This resulted in an almost cult-like devotion to them by the poor, and initially at least, these policies had some positive effects on the economy too. But it ultimately led to excessive borrowing, investor flight, loan defaults and serious economic decline. Perón's popularity eventually started to take a dive, not just because of his economic mismanagement and repressive dictatorship, but because his socialist reformist programs failed to account for a deep Catholic opposition to his progressive divorce legislation 
as well as decriminalisation of prostitution. By now, his government had incarcerated, exiled or simply executed large numbers of dissidents from both the left and the right. But when he deported two Catholic priests, who were highly critical of his regime, news circulated that he had been excommunicated by the Pope, and pro-Catholic elements within the armed forces staged an assassination attempt and killed hundreds of his supporters in an air raid that bombed the Plaza de Mayo during a rally in 1955. Reprisals and counter-reprisals followed, but Perón was soon ousted in yet another military coup and forced into exile, ending up under Franco's protection in nationalist Spain. A succession of both civilian and military dictatorships followed, but the country continued to sink into further economic chaos. Perón eventually returned, only to die in 1974, with yet another run of military coups and dictatorships that only made things worse and whose violent, repressive regimes brought morale in the country to rock bottom. Meanwhile, negotiations between the UK and Argentina had been going on for some years and Prime Minister Thatcher's government even sent its foreign minister to the Falklands to try and convince the locals to accept a lease-back arrangement with Argentina that would see a transition of ownership, much like was being successfully negotiated with China for Hong Kong. But the population of the Falklands, viewing the run of brutal dictatorships and disastrous conditions over on the mainland, were horrified at the prospect of coming under volatile Argentine sovereignty and lobbied hard to sink any deals being made in London that would see them become unwilling citizens of what they saw as a failed foreign state. A key component of the post-war decolonisation programme overseen by the UN was the right of self-determination of formerly subject peoples which the Falklanders insisted gave them the right to reject any kind of involuntary handover. The Argentines rejected this claim as they refused to recognise the rights of the islanders, an ironically imperialist position considering what they themselves were demanding over at the UN. Nevertheless, with the economy in tatters and a population on the verge of revolution, the ruling military junta did what any failing regime does, distract the population using the threat of an external enemy and play the patriotism card. The UK had long been winding down its bases and withdrawing ships from smaller holdings in the South Atlantic, which the junta tentatively occupied in late March 1982. Believing the British had neither the capacity nor willingness to escalate, they now mounted a full amphibious assault and invaded the Malvinas, that is to say, the Falklands, taking the capital, Port Stanley, on the 2nd of April 1982 and the island of South Georgia the next day. Prime Minister Thatcher, whose popularity was, as mentioned before, ironically also at rock bottom, immediately called in her cabinet and available military chiefs most of whom were out of town. By a strange quirk of history, only one admiral, Henry Leach, was in London at the time, and he made his way to see her as soon as news of the Argentine invasion broke. It turns out that he was pretty much the only senior military advisor who was hawkish enough to emphasise that not only was it possible to liberate the islands, but that it was politically imperative for Britain to do so. It would turn out that the other advisers were convinced that a retaliatory expedition would be a disaster, but they were absent from those crucial early briefs. Despite being completely blindsided and having very little information to go on, Admiral Leach convinced her, and within 48 hours, with the backing of Parliament, 
the UK had hastily assembled a naval task force and was on its way to the South Atlantic. Her advisers were nervous, and the Americans were concerned it would draw the Soviets into deeper ties with Latin America. But the UN had just issued a resolution for Argentina to withdraw, which she saw as tacit support. Ambassadors from several nations engaged in shuttle diplomacy in an attempt to de-escalate. But the die was cast, and Prime Minister Thatcher, characteristically, refused to back down or negotiate unless the Argentines first withdrew. Her typically decisive and swift response convinced then-President Ronald Reagan to publicly back the UK and supply it with logistical as well as intelligence support despite the fact that Pentagon analysts had told him the mission would be a complete failure. By the 21st of April, the task force of over 120 ships split into two battle groups, with the smaller one heading to South Georgia, landing commandos and marines who took it and crippled an Argentine submarine in a matter of five days. The main group headed straight for the Falklands, while bombers operating from Atlantic naval bases began cratering the three runways on the islands with modest success, forcing the Argentinian Air Force to rely mostly on their mainland air bases that pushed its capacity to the very limit of its range. Nevertheless, Argentina had the fighter and interceptor numbers to command complete air superiority and moreover, they were in possession of ship-killing French Exocet missiles. By the 1st of May, contact began in earnest, with aircraft engaging in the skies and the British nuclear submarine Conqueror sinking an Argentine light cruiser, the General Belgrano, the next day, with the loss of over 300 souls. As the ship appeared to be withdrawing from the theatre, there was controversy for some time whether the order to sink it was a war crime, but in subsequent years, surviving Argentine officers, including its captain, have confirmed that it was actually manoeuvring and had every intention of engaging British vessels. In any case, Argentinian air raids soon retaliated, sinking the destroyer Sheffield, along with a number of other smaller ones in the weeks that followed. British recon forces came ashore by the 15th of May and by the 21st, a full amphibious assault of 4,000 special forces came ashore in the west, largely unopposed. 13,000 Argentine soldiers, many of them conscripts, awaited them in fortified positions across the islands. Over the next week, part of the British forces pushed south and after a tough fight, captured Darwin and Goose Green, taking almost a thousand prisoners. In the north, commandos from both sides slogged it out in fierce fighting for several days, with the British eventually emerging victorious, all the while being strafed by Argentinian air raids. By the beginning of June, the British landed another 5,000 infantry to the south of Stanley, and the noose began to quickly tighten around the Argentinian defensive line. With Stanley finally liberated by the 20th of June, mopping up operations seeing the complete liberation of surrounding islands a few days later. 649 Argentines and 255 British soldiers lost their lives, all so that a few thousand inhabitants would remain British subjects. And Britain herself, who was looking for a way to hand it over to an impatient military junta anyway, would both save face on the international scene. Such are the tragedies of politics. But for Prime Minister Thatcher, the victory salvaged not only her public image, but also the prestige of the UK showing that it was still a player on the world stage. Thatcher's Conservatives would go on and win the general election the following year in a landslide, 
giving her a comfortable mandate not seen in years. The military junta back in Buenos Aires, on the other hand, lost all credibility, and the following year saw free elections and a leftist civilian government take power. For the Falkland Islanders, the war resulted in full British citizenship and a solid commitment by the UK to invest in its economic development. <laughs> 